You're tuned into N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in-depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news with your host, Greg Prescott and Kendra Gilbert. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in three, two, one, one, one. Namaste and welcome to N5D Radio, coming to you from the 99% Quartz Crystal Sands of Sarasota, Florida, every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. midnight in the U.K., and 9 a.m. in the morning in Australia. I'm your host, Greg Prescott from N5D.com, and for the next two hours, we're going to be raising the vibration of the planet, galaxy, and universe. Tonight, astrologer Jim Delacoli, also known as Panther Jim, 1995 on YouTube, will be returning as our guest. And he'll be taking your calls, but once again, we would like to request that you keep your calls focused on astrology questions instead of personal horoscopes so we can make this a learning experience for all of us. And right now, I'd like to bring in my co-host coming to you from Ocala, Florida, licensed massage therapist, energy worker, and artist, Kendra Gilbert. Hi, Kendra. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Greg, and how are you? (laughs) Well, I'm totally digging having all these astrologers on N5D Radio because astrology plays such a huge role in everything that we do, and it's all about paying attention to the cycles of time and being able to learn from our past mistakes. So, how are you doing tonight? That was a long answer. (laughs) I'm good. How are you? (laughs) Oh, well, you know what? I am doing really, really great, and um, I couldn't agree more about um, astrology being such a major part in everybody's lives. Um, It it definitely has earned its place. So um, in today's news, or tonight's news, of course, you know, the uh, the shooting at the Navy Yard is on everyone's mind. It took place in Washington, and it came as no real surprise for a lot of theorists who feel that, you know, this was uh, a possible distraction or event. Um, and it was, you know, likely to occur anyway in order to divert the public attention away from other world events. Uh, although these distractions are often dramatic and emotionally triggering, they're also often tainted with unexplainable and incoherent facts and details. Of course, one can always find comfort in the mainstream media's approach at keeping us well informed. What would we possibly do without those guys? In other news, we've got fireballs being spotted around the world, as well as 13 new potentially dangerous near-Earth objects being reported. Many are saying it is debris from Comet Ison, not exactly the huge catastrophic event predicted by Patty Broussard last month. But um, nonetheless, uh, it is what it is. Uh, and it, you know, it has... Uh, you know, everybody wondering why there seems to be so much mystery involving in this comment, including NASA's uh, uh, extreme intolerable way that they like to, you know, withhold images and other documentation from the public it tends to uh, make you scratch your head. And last but certainly not least, we have the memo that confirmed every conspiracy freak's fantasy. <laughs> Greg Palast, an investigative journalist, uncovered a secret memo which explains how top U.S. Treasury officials secretly conspired with a small cabal of banker big shots to benefit themselves. The We Are Change organization further explains within their news video description on YouTube that the memo indicates high-level politicians such as Larry Summers, who was most likely going to be appointed for the next term of the Fed Reserve by Obama. Interestingly, Summers voluntarily has removed his name for consideration to be the next holder of the Federal Reserve Chair after this memo was uncovered seems as if there may be uh, way more to Summer's withdrawal than a sudden burst of interest in in ethics. So for more of these types of news headlines and more informative alternative media, please visit us on the N5D website, and remember to always use your own discernment and place fear aside when researching for truth. Back to you, Greg. Sally sells seashells. See, I can't say that. See, see, I'm telling you, tonight is a tongue twister night for me, so get ready to wait your girlfriend. It's going to be fine. <laughs> Got it so, out, though. What, what's your uh, initial opinion on Common Ice on? You know, I just, just kind of like, you know, along the same lines as Ellen, and, you know, I just hope it's not, it doesn't just turn out 
to be like you know this little cosmic fart in the in the sky and you know and, and it doesn't you know re, you know amount to anything it just it's i don't know fear mongering possibly again I, you know i don't know i mean i'm looking at the charts and all of these you know things that are coming forward about showing its trajectory and you got people talking about how it blew through um asteroids near mars and now you know all this debris hitting us Greg, I just, I just don't know. There's just a lot to be, I guess, just uh, to wait and see, and, and, and I don't know. At this point, I think discernment's really uh, <laughs> a major need. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your words of cosmic fart, seeing how you had beans tonight for dinner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, you say, oh, Ellen and Ellen, Ellen, and oh, uh -huh. poof, you know, poof. Yeah. <laughs> And, like and with everything that's going on right now, is this just a distraction? Exactly. That's just also a very big possibility because we know a lot of that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. So just a, a reminder, N5D.com will be hosting our first annual Return to Atlantis conference here in Sarasota, Florida on the 99% Quartz Crystal Sands of Lido Key Beach on the weekend of October 4th through the 6th, 2013. And the event is officially sold out, but you can still watch it online through live stream. We have six amazing speakers lined up, including Lisa Renee, Teal Scott, Laura Eisenhower, Dr. Dream, astrologer Tom K. Pacha Lesher, and galactic historian Andrew Bartzis, who has the rare ability to read universal and individual Akashic records. Included in this amazing event is a Friday night new moon beach galactivation a Saturday night Cosmic Reunion Beach Party, and on Sunday night we're all going to meet at the Siesta Key Drum Circle. Our speakers will be featured from late morning until mid-afternoon, so that will leave plenty of time for everybody to go sightseeing or simply enjoy the 99% quartz crystal sands here on Sarasota's Gulf Shores. Now, as I mentioned, this event is sold out, but you can still watch all of our speakers online through live stream by visiting www.in5devents.com or click the link below this video. Also, we're going to be having Chris Hales and Hope Girl moderating and commentating on the live stream event. So it'll kind of be like a football pregame show with commentary before, between, and after our speakers. So we are really excited to be, be bringing them aboard to this event. And let's take a peek into our queue here to see if our guest is here yet. No, I don't see him yet. So let me ask you this, Kendra. Mm -hmm. According to your solar return reading with Lavendar, mm -hmm. you were an astrologer in a past life. So in this life, what got you interested in astrology? You know, when, when I found this out, it, it really it didn't surprised me, but um, it did kind of make me wonder why I had, hadn't been um, more interested in learning astrology myself personally um, in this lifetime. And, um, you know, I, I've always been interested with it to, you know, just to more or less utilize it, but also to go to other people to kind of help me, you know, you know, you go to somebody, you have your chart done, you know, you you go to other people for the service. It was nothing that I actually wanted to really feel like I wanted to learn how to do myself. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but, you know, you know, it, like I said, you know, before, um, you know, I was introduced to a lot of this stuff very early in life. Um, and uh, I feel really lucky. I feel blessed because I feel like it really helped me um, open my mind up and it didn't allow me to become too close-minded to, uh, to other things. And, you know, um, it, it was a learning experience for sure growing up. And that experience has just gotten continually larger and larger and larger as I've gotten older. So, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I, I really think it's a, a, a phenomenal way to learn about yourself and um, when you see how accurate this information is when it's presented to you it just blows you away so well not only about yourself but about you, you know you can you can do a reading on a country or a particular mm -hmm. state or where, where, wherever and whenever something was born and it doesn't necessarily have to be a person you can also learn a lot about you know relationships you know between you and your parents or your spouse or your children and uh, and especially a lot about yourself, especially through the uh, like the retrogrades of the planet. Now, I'm looking into the queue, and it looks like Jim is waiting there. So would you like to introduce him, Kendra? 
Sure, um, as long as you can unmute him because I don't see where he's yep. at. Oh, okay, there. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, our guest tonight is no stranger to the N5D family, Jim Delacoli, also known as Panther Jim 1995 on YouTube. He's returned to offer his insights on current and upcoming world events and uses his experience and knowledge of astrology to explain the synchronistic relationship between the heavenly bodies, our planet, and humanity. Jim started his 12-year journey into astrology in 2001 after receiving a natal chart reading, which turned him from skeptic to researcher and now into a professional full-service astrologer. You can, of course, find Jim on his website at YPI2012. That's Y-P-I-E 2012.com. Welcome back to N5D Radio, Jim. It's so wonderful to have you with us again. Thank you. It's good to be back, Kendra. Um, Greg, how are you all doing tonight? Outstanding. How are you doing, brother? I'm good. I... uh, I've been tried, uh, probably put to my toughest test here lately with all these planets. So I hear you guys already talking about ISON and a few other things, so it's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And uh, we have a whole slew of questions lined up for you. Do you want to jump right into it? Yeah, unless you guys want to be a little lighthearted, because I think we're going to get uh, pretty serious quick. So whatever you guys want to do, I'm ready. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we only have two hours. <laughs> okay. Let's jump in then. <laughs> all right. Okay, so alternative news websites such as N5D Alternative News have been exposing the lies that our government have been telling the people in order to initiate a World War III scenario, and now they look foolish as the entire world sees through their lies. As it turns out, the government is now trying to instigate a war with Iran. Is there anything in the charts that supports a World War III scenario? And more importantly, is there anything that shows how these truths will continue to rise up to the surface to deter such scenarios? Yeah, um, take the first part of that. Is there anything in the charts for wars to rise up? We're, um, we've supposedly been the policemen of, on the planet um, as far as sending our military out. and um, We all know what a far side is. It's really about going after the money. And uh, so I, was, I pulled up a chart of the U.S. And, and then where the planets are today. And we have Pluto um, in its natal position for the U.S., um, it means 248 years of past uh, plus. Um, I'm sorry, it's opposing its natal sun position, and um, that tells me that we're really being tested for who are we, what are we, and, and what really matters to us as we move forward. So, we, you know, I, I'm looking at Pluto, and Capricorn has really, uh, since 2000, they started all these uprisings of bringing from below the surface uh, just what is the truth out there so we can all get a good look at it and and uh, because Pluto's so slow in its transit, uh, it's going to take its time. And so the, everything's just bubbling at this point. It's get, it's probably at the surface, but we just can't, like, pick everything up yet because it's just not time. Mm-hmm. So is there anything that shows how these truths, such as, you know, what we're, what we're reporting on in 5D Alternative News and all these other um, websites, alternative news websites, is there anything that, that you see that will kind of give us any kind of a, uh, hope that this kind of stuff will still continue to, to happen, that all these whistleblowers will be coming out of the woodwork and all that good stuff. Yeah, I think we want to look at Uranus transiting through Aries at this time. Got there in March of 2011. And Uranus uh, is the planet that brings the energies of, I'm going to find the truth at all costs, and I'm going to just go in my in the most direct form possible. Um, it's square in this Pluto transit of Capricorn. And, and so what's happening is... Um, those that have uh, been in power, uh, the, the, how they got there and why they're truly there is being revealed. Um, because Uranus works in, its mo- in the most direct form, it's tough for a lot of the, the people um, on the planet to pick this up initially. People that have kind of uh, used, all, used all their faculties have been picking it up, and they know. Like to us, Greg and Kendra, we, we know and we sniff it out immediately. Um, but it's the masses that have to awaken it because Pluto's in Capricorn and Uranus is in Aries the masses are going to awaken. It just may, may take an event that we may not like initially to uh, awaken them. Absolutely. You know, I, I can't help but to feel a little bit paranoid about today's event, especially considering so much is taking place right now with the situation in Iran, Syria, the Fed Reserve. just always seems to be some sort of distraction right on cue to keep people's attention diverted. So, Jim, was there any connection in astrology with today's shooting at the Navy Yard? Yeah, I was... Um, I was kind of looking at, at what we're dealing with, and um, I always look at the, the signs that square where the eclipse is falling, and right now the eclipses are falling, the north node, or, or where we need to open to 
the universe's message of the universe's energy is in Scorpio, and then the south node is always opposite that in Taurus. So I always uh, look, and, and for the listeners out there, they should really pay attention if they're squaring up um, Taurus and uh, Scorpio by, by any planets or any powerful planets or, you know, any powerful points in the chart falling in either Leo or Aquarius. And today we had an Aquarius moon. And uh, so that always mm-hmm. brings chaos, and it brings extra chaos when uh, we deal with uh, squaring the eclipses. So I-, I watch these Aquarius moons. Everybody should watch whenever the moon goes through the sign of Aquarius, Aquarius and just make sure that they just pay attention to everything that goes on. So, uh, you know, sometimes the event doesn't seem so uh, dramatic like today's, but it's, it's always something that's trying to um, reveal. It's always revealing. It's always trying to get us to the truth. So I think people are picking up, as you said, uh, Kendra and Greg, on, that these are false flags and these are events that they're trying to keep us from, you know, the, the, all the events that have been occurring because they, they, they know that they can, if they put enough on the, on the news and enough, you know, in front of us, that we'll follow that and then lose yeah. sense of, of what else, everything else going on. So that Aquarius moon, I think, got us here. What what else can we expect during an Aquarius moon? Um, I always like the Aquarius moon to uh, surprise me, um, but I look at an Aquarius moon as uh, Aquarius. The energy is for us looking into the future and trying to understand tomorrow uh, a little better where or where these things are headed. So when the Aquarius moon happens, especially now that they're squaring these eclipses, I look for strange events to happen to try to keep me off of kind of using all my instincts, if that makes sense. So. You know, this thing threw us for a loop, but what you got to say is, wait a minute, this is going on, but what's really going on? And it sounds like a lot more people are doing that. And so we need to watch these Aquarius moons as we, as we move forward and just pick up on that energy. So, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Jim, I was wondering, could you maybe explain a little bit about the cardinal signs and the significance of the, uh, of the Aquarius full moon with all four cardinals hosting planets? You spoke about yeah, this absolutely. in your video. Yeah, um, the cardinal signs, uh, anybody that does astrology or anybody that wants to get in astrology, they should learn the elements and, and then um, uh, the signs and the houses and what they stand for. And the cardinal signs are the first sign in each quadrant. So if we divide the, the natal chart into 12, it, it would be houses 1, 4, 7, and 10. And those are handle one of each of the elements, um, and it's where we must take action. It's where we must do something. You cannot be stagnant here. Um, stagnation leads to um, somebody else then causing you to have to to, have to react or, you know, you have to take action because of something done to you. So whenever we deal with cardinal signs, uh, you, you you must get on into the, the frame of thought that I, I have to take action. It's time for me to, to move forward, and I need to, to um, move forward in a way that I'm using all my faculties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you seemed very urgent with your message about us needing to go within and listening to the innermost gut feelings of our, of our you know, beings during this upcoming full moon and uh, what we should be doing right now, where we should be, how we should be preparing, uh, but more importantly, acting upon those imp- impulses also. And, I, you know, I think I feel the same as you do. I mean, um, you know, a bit frustrated because things seem to just be moving so slowly but, I mean, they are coming along. I mean, the last thing we want to do is be caught off a card. But do you have any other advice or suggestions to humanity as far as what they might consider doing to prepare for all this? Yeah, I, I think that we have a, a trine by signs on three slow-moving planets uh, in all the water signs. It's Saturn and Scorpio, Jupiter and Cancer, and Neptune and Pisces. And, and I think that with those three planets there, um, our ability to... Um, reflect on the past to kind of um, mix that with where we are right now and then also blend that with where we think this is headed. I think we're in an un, unparalleled time in human history that we can actually change our past by going back over it um, from this uh, state that we're in now um, and, and really help uh, guide where we're going in the future to make a big difference on where all this can end up. So. Uh, I'm looking at this big trine and these water signs um, to ramp up uh, when we get closer to end of October, November, and then again late um, uh, February, early March. uh, These water signs are just going to be loaded with planets, and I'm really thinking that we're going to have some uh, unbelievable gifts and powers and just understanding uh, uh, at our beck and call to use if 
if we just keep fear out. So I'm really hoping that uh, people do this. I'm really hoping that they, they're realizing the everyday synchronicities and the deja vus and the, you know, the, the little telltale signs of the, they think something and it happened and, or they say, see something, they almost can predict where it's going and it does. I'm really hoping people get in more touch with that and follow these water signs and follow this trying that's trying to help us um, because we've done all this before. I think we've been visited by other beings. I think we've, you know, we've had uh, uh, understanding of the universe way, uh, and now it's way more than what we're being led to believe. And I think it's time for us to tap into that. And these water signs being activated by planets are, are really trying to help. Us. On our last show, we were we had a paranormal extravaganza, and we were talking about all this really cool stuff. And one of the things I was talking about was how all these metaphysical animals are coming into my life. I had a uh, woodchuck <laughs> and uh, a, a bear and a small frog. Now, the woodchuck and the bear are both animals that hibernate. They go into the ground, and they essentially reborn. They get reborn afterwards in the spring. Well, the bear goes into the cave and gets reborn in the spring. And the tadpole, the, the frog starts out as, as a tadpole, but then gets reborn into a frog. So... You know, I, I definitely agree with you to pay attention to all these little things that are coming up in your life. Now, what intentions do you plan on setting forth during the upcoming Aquarius full moon? Uh, we just we had the Aquarius full moon. The intentions I put plan on putting out moving forward. Um, right. Uh, we'll be um, we'll be experiencing a new moon in Libra coming up in uh, the fourth of October. But before that. Uh, the, we're going to have an interesting lineup in full moon of Pisces that's going to fall really close to the uh, equinox, which will happen. The equinox will be on the 22nd, but the full moon of Pisces will be on the 19th. And uh, this is part of what I'm talking about, planets getting in water signs. Uh, the moon will, will be in Pisces, and it will be with Neptune here uh, fairly close, and we're going to have uh, Saturn and Venus real close and Mar in uh, Scorpio, and then we'll have of course, Jupiter in um, Cancer, and it, it, you know these four planets are going to try each other, um, and, and five planets are going to try each other. I think we're going to really like what we can what can come of this if we pay attention. Now, because it's so close to that equinox, Greg, I know we were going to try to talk about some of that. Um, the equinox, mm -hmm. the fall equinox is um, the spring equinox is for you to put uh, out to the universe that you're ready to begin anew. We're going to plant a seed. We're going to you know, cultivate that seed. We don't really know what possibly can come of that seed as far as the potential, but we know that it's time. We have this urge, the spring's here, and, you know, the sun starts to shine a little longer each day. We feel the urge to, to grow or, or to, you know, just to, like, get things to expand in, in our um, awareness and in our world. The, well, the fall, the opposite of that, is where we take this, what we planted in the spring, to harvest. And um, so it's very interesting to watch this Pisces new moon where all things are hidden. Um, Pisces, the sign of um, the psychic realm, the, the 12th house of trying to put it all together. So there's going to be so much happening because that new moon in Pisces will happen on the 19th of September. And then we're going to turn around the 22nd um, of September. And then we're going to experience the fall, the equinox, where the sun crosses over. Um, from our perspective here on Earth, it's exactly over the equator. So if you're sitting down somewhere on the equator, you'll have a 12-hour uh, day is sun uh, time of sunlight and a 12-hour time of night, and then so the sun's crossing back over the end of the southern hemisphere. And uh, what we want to look at that time is because we're now taking what we planted in our you know, the seeds that have grown into a fruit, we want to take that to harvest. And so what I'm looking for here is there's going to be a lot of commotion going on. Pisces is going to be dealing heavily because the moon's so close and uh, so late in the sign. And I think that's going to really bring about um, an opportunity for us if we truly look at it from a perspective of this is an opportunity to take the past, take the present, and take where we want to go with it and really um, put it out there. So I think there's going to be a huge opportunity for us during this time to see the world as it is up to that point and then really start turning this and taking action. So. Uh, I, I look for a huge opportunity for a really aggressive stance by people um, and by powers to be uh, around this equinox because they know it's time to present the the idea that was uh, you know um, brought into fruition or, or brought into creation back in the spring. It's time to bring some, bring it to the world, bring it to the physical world, and really try to do something with it. 
Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly not a coincidence when wars seem to start during autumn, a period of time when flowers die and the leaves fall off trees. Can you explain to our listeners how the powers that be use the September equinox as a tool for going to war? Yeah, I, I think that um, because it's uh, a time, and they know they use this, they use astrology way more than they'll ever let a, lead us on. But they they mm -hmm. know that uh, Libra starts when the sun crosses over the um, at equator. Then the sun goes into Libra, the sign of Libra from our perspective, and that's where you have you deal with others. So this is where you start to push your agenda on others and see how they handle it. This is why stock markets crash in the fall um, in October. This is why wars mm -hmm. start now because this is a great time to push your agenda. Um, and if they're doing it, I'm telling you, we can do it. We've just got to band together. We've got to start, you know, uh, in mass, putting uh, the, the universe's um, beautiful, wonderful energies uh, to work uh, with us, not us fighting it or us uh, fighting somebody else using it. It's time for us to use it and, and support uh, what we want. So, you know, what happens whenever you encounter labor energy, it's you encountering others. And if they, they strike first, you're reacting. It's time for us to start striking first. And there's no better time than around the 22nd to start saying, wait a minute, I'm going to start calling BS on, on what I know is BS. I'm going to start really putting my uh, what I know and, and what I believe can happen out there. No better time mm -hmm. because the sun sun's behind you, and it's time. It's time to harvest that which you worked on. And, and so if we would do that, Greg, and, and, and really look and, and get more behind these planets, we would, you would be amazed at, at how easy this can be and, and then how fruitful it can um, you know, become. Oh, I believe it. So, so can the September equinox, can that be seen maybe in a possible way as a, as, as a death of our old ways? What you want to do, you know, as you look through the spring, we all got to go through all the planets cycle at different or transit at different times um, from our perspective, and we want to get behind that sun cycle because it's the life giver. It's so you know brings light and sheds light onto the darkness, and and so we can take the fall and 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 put um, the, our ideas out and realize that when we put something out, we something's got to like give, something's got to be removed. And the old ways that just don't work, or the old ways that you've, you know, that have been revealed to you, that you know are not, you know, something that's conducive to being parallel with nature and congruent with nature, you must remove those. So absolutely, a lot of deaths can come here, and they need to because it's time to move to another level and experience this through others. Hmm. Now, you know, uh, Jim, do you think it's silly? Because there's a lot of people out there that seem to be waiting for a hero. I mean, it's already been 2,000 years of any day now for the Christians and many different religious right. followers. I mean, are, are we the ones <laughs> who will ultimately have to fight for ourselves to get us out of this mess, or do you see a divine intervention of some sort coming through? I've, uh, I'm, I'll be excited when we get to the Pluto part of this, but I, we've slowly ramped up to... Uh, um, the energies that through, and Greg, I think we talked about this a couple shows ago about the Pluto and Virgo people and then, you know, the Pluto and Libra and all the way up to where now we're getting Pluto and Capricorn people. And what we're having mm -hmm. here, and I have no problem saying this, is that the children, each generation as they're born, are way more advanced than we are. And and so uh, we, we have come to the time that it's time to stand up and, and we're our own hero. It's not that we're on an island. It's not that we're alone but we have what we need, and so now it's time to access that. It, it's amazing that, you know, the powers to be in society itself is, has come to where we're so occupied with sports and Internet and iPods and iPhones and, uh, you know, tweeting and, and uh, you know, uh, Facebook. And everybody has you, – you have some at any moment you can tap into what's going on throughout the world. But the real th reason that's happened is because – they know we're advanced, and they don't want us to tap into our own power. They don't want us to know. We already know. We've been here. We've done this. And if the, the sooner or, or the, you know, the more uh, we're able to tap into that, the less power they're going to have. And it's just it'll continue that way to where we get to the point where we tip it, and then they know they're in trouble. Hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, when I think of all the possible future outcomes for humanity, you know, without some form of leadership from a higher level of consciousness or spiritual guidance, you know, we, we're still going to have a lot of difference of, of opinions, religious preferences, and other forms of ego that are going to make it really difficult to really truly unite humanity together. Um, you know, this, this is more of a personal question, I guess, for you is, you know, how do you think things are going to pan out in the aftermath of the things to come? Do you feel that there's going to be some sort of indisputable God or leader that's going to take, you know, humanity to the next level? Um, there, there's a sense of just what is that we all have. And I think that will be what returns um, if we all tap into our powers. It's not going to be an easy thing that's going to happen. Um, and it won't be simple, and it won't be quick. Um, so, what, you know, what I believe is going to happen is we're going to tap right into that power, and we'll know it. And when we do that, the ones that do that, you'll almost see them as godlike because, you'll, you know, you, you will look at them and you'll, you just know they have, and they just have an understanding, and there's a lot of people starting to pick that up. And what mm-hmm. it'll get back to is things are very, very, very simple in the end. It's not complicated. We complicated it along the way. Yeah, I agree. And we were kind of talking we're, about that earlier, too. Go, go ahead, Jim. Well, I, I was at Kendra, she was hoping I'd say there's going to be a hero. I, I think the hero's deep within you, and I think you know this, um, but we've been so built to have that godlike or that half-human, half-god creature or that all-knowing whatever and you know now that we're here where we need to be uh, we've uh, we've lined this up perfectly we have that within us and and trust me i'm not uh, somebody that doesn't believe in god i know there's a higher power that has helped us and guided us and and you know allowed us to make the mistakes and do the things right and wrong but we're at a point and i'm looking at this astrologically that it's all right in front of us and and it's it's going to end up probably being so simple that it's it's uh, we're we're almost going to fight it. I guess is what what'll happen. Yeah, I, and actually, I I, I agree with that. Um, I I just you know I'd like to put questions out there that I think other people might be wondering also from different perspectives. You know, because we we do have such a heavy religious dogma that we're dealing with with all these different religious religions out there and the programming and everything, and everybody just keeps on thinking that you know there's going to be this this hero that's going to appear, this you know this deity, this god or something that's going to come down and make everything all better. And I want to see more personal action steps being made by individuals, more so than, oh, well, we just got to wait and see what happens because that's just, you know, the divine plan or whatever. So, um, no, I'm with you. I, I, I actually okay. agree okay. completely. I think we are we are the ones we've been waiting for. <laughs> yes. For sure. And, and I, I, just one case in point here real quick, um, and I don't mind saying that my wife was at her uh, the school my daughter goes to, and they were on the playground, and they talked about, I guess the girl died up in uh, somewhere in the Northeast. Somebody brought mm-hmm. something with peanuts in, and she touched it, and she had a severe reaction, and they had whatever you need in the classroom to you just give them the shot. I guess they, they're going to be fine. But her parents didn't sign the consent form, and so they didn't give her the shot, and she passed away. Oh, this man. Is exactly, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and yeah. the one lady in the group said, well, I, you know, I'm a nurse, and if I was there, I would have not given her a shot. If she didn't sign the consent form, I don't want to get sued. And so I asked my wife, what did she say? And my wife said, I didn't say anything back mm-hmm. to her. Um, and then I said, well, the next time I hope you know, you can find it in you to say, what if that was your daughter? Because that's really what it boils mm-hmm. down to. Uh, you've got to wear both shoes. Put, your, put yourself mm-hmm. in both sides of the equation. That's where we're at right now. We're at that karmic, that time, the ending of um, – if I'm against something, let me put myself in the shoes to understand why I'm against it. And if we do that, um, the, the the planets are going to help us and get us to karmically understand uh, the truth, nature, uh, the simplicity of life itself, and, and you will make the right decision. You know, one thing I've been thinking about is as the population increases, there's more and more souls incarnating to this planet who were not here beforehand – so where do you think these souls are coming from, and wh- why do you think they're deciding to, to incarnate here and now in this point in space and time? The, the more I study astrology and the more I like, let my, all my faculties work, I think it's the, the accumulation of the souls that have been here because they know it's time. It's like time of reckoning. So we're building the planet up um, so people have that chance to – I don't want to say cross over because I don't really think death is much more than a change of the form that you're in. 
Um, but it's come to the realization of what you really are, and that's why these souls are trying to pile in here at the end, because they know and they're advanced. They've done the work, so it's time, and they know it. Yeah, in your latest video that I uh, watched, Jim, um, uh, you know, I, I, you did have a, a very strong sense of urgency uh, as far as getting a message out saying that, you know, hey, there's some stuff coming. It's going to be some destructive energy that's coming. Do you mean, you know, I mean, are you talking about physical destruction here on this planet? And if so, how much, how many lives do you think? I mean, is there anything in, in the chart that's showing a massive crossing over of souls um, during this period of time? It's, you know, you, I think if we're all wise enough, we almost step back and look at our lives from a perspective of, What's really going on? You know, I know I'm in the middle of this, and this is going, you know, this is happening, that's happening, but what's really going on? And what you're seeing is so many people are so far from just the truth. I mean, like the nurse that said, I'm not going to help a dying child because I don't want to get mm-hmm. sued. I mean, the lawsuit should mean nothing in that equation, you know? And uh, so some people are so far, they've been taught so much, they've been overeducated. Our education system has totally um, taken us from our instincts. And so, you know, the ones that advance in the financial sector and advance in, you know, in the political world, they're so far removed from what is that I really don't know if they have a chance um, to make it through. I think their lesson is coming back and fixing the mess that's ever or whatever ends up. And so they'll be in a situation mm-hmm. that they got to fix the mess that got created. But uh, really, I'm looking for, yeah, I'm looking for depths. Uh, there's going to be, I think, extreme devastation, and we're not far from that. And I'm not a fear monger. I'm. I'm ready. Um, I have I have children. I have grandchildren. Um, mm-hmm. I love this place, but you know it got so far out of control, and nobody really wants to face it. Uh, as far as in mass, if that makes sense. So yeah. when 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 these uh, Pluto and Cancer generations kind of re- go back to the source, I think that's really going to start tipping the scales in our direction. Yes, it's so mm-hmm. slow. It's, it's just it's painstaking for me um, because Pluto moves so slow. It's, it's uh, you know, it's at nine, eight, nine degrees right now. When it gets back to 10, 11, which it will be when we get to, uh, you know, late fall, early winter, um, that's when uh, everything is going to show itself. And then that's when we got to, we're going to be forced to really start making some decisions. Um, I deal, uh, and I, I probably, I got to be careful. I, I, I have a company in another industry and, and uh, this thing is out of control. Um, from the industry I'm in, uh, and it's the food industry, and it's it's really going to be interesting what happens because you, most people don't know what's happening, but I'm watching it from a very close-up view, and, and this thing's out of control from the food perspective. And so when that starts happening, then we're really going to start having troubles. Now, one thing, one thing I've been uh, following, uh, the United States debt limit has been stuck at $16.7 trillion for... 121 days. So in other words, the U.S. Treasury had already exceeded this limit last December and should have defaulted a long time ago, yet it's being propped up by hot air and bullshit. The Treasury has set an October 18th debt limit in which the United States government will no longer be able to pay their bills unless Congress raises the debt ceiling, which is just the fictitious numbers anyway to begin with. So what do you see happening around October 18th? Is the U.S. government at risk of defaulting or possibly shutting down? Yeah, I, I, here's what I see happening coming up. It's going to be an interesting uh, – and I pulled a chart for the 28th because uh, I've been looking for that as well. And I, um, as we, we, You're going to see a lot happen here um, from now till the 22nd of uh, – uh, September, sorry. And um, w- what we see here, I think then we need to look at that Aquarius moon um, that falls in October on the 13th, around the 13th, 14th, and that's going to tell us what's going to happen on the 18th. From my perspective right now, it, it's a crapshoot, but they're, I think they're going to uh, put a lot of pressure on us, and I think they're going to have to end up raising the debt ceiling based on what I'm looking at right now to mm-hmm. keep this thing going, but it's going to be temporary. And because they know, I think they know what's coming in, in late October, early November, December. And so I think that they'll put a temporary thing on. Then when we get to there, I don't think it'll matter once we get to 2014. Um, because that's why I think they'll try to push it off to uh, at some point. Well, I know on, on we know, Inside Greg, B, 
On Inside D, I put out an article about this World Bank whistleblower who said that, no, this I'm sorry, this was a, a Fortune 500 company uh, whistleblower who said that we can expect some kind of financial collapse between August and October. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. you know, we have a, a penumbral lunar eclipse on October 18th, which coincides with the uh, date that the Treasury had set for the debt limit. So I'm wondering how this all ties in together. Along with the full yeah, moon, eclipse. I believe, on October 18th. Uh, yes, yeah, and the eclipses are, um, uh, it's going to be an Aries full moon, and it's going to be, uh, have Uranus involved, not real heavily, but Uranus will be involved, of course, as well as Pluto and, and uh, um, the moon and the sun. And I, I, I'm looking at that as being uh, like, the panic's going to start setting in because people are going to start, however they talk about this, even if they try to push it off, people are going to realize that something's wrong. There's something's not right. So they're really going to, like, start to really, like, uh, you know, personally start going, there's a problem and we this can't go on. And so that's going to be like the awakening process around that time. And because it's an eclipse, I'm, I'm – probably talk a little more than I should because eclipses are such a wild card, but, uh, you know, because Uranus is going to be involved. I'm thinking the truth's coming here, and, uh, you know, then we'll see the next two eclipses in others' money and your money, which will be in, in Taurus and Scorpio. Um, so I do think that the 18th and the eclipse is going to reveal some. I think they'll try to push it off, but I think the panic will set in from the, the you know, the people in mass, I think, and so this thing will really start showing itself. Mm-hmm. Now, another thing that's coming up, Comet Ison, uh, which we were talking about earlier on the news, is, is expected to make its closest passage to Earth on November 28th of this year. So do you see anything unusual for that day? Yeah. Um, I looked up November 28th, and um, the moon's going to be in Libra. And uh, I, I find that interesting because it's going to be early in Libra, and Remember, Libra's where you got to reveal things, and uh, because of the moon will be there, and uh, you know the 28th will fall about a week off the eclipses, so we'll uh, be almost, uh, you know, we'll be away from the eclipses enough, I think, to um, where the moon will be like almost half. And I, so I think that what's going to happen is, uh, I'm trying to say this in a way, I'm not trying to cause too much much panic, but I, I would mm -hmm. it would not surprise me. That we would see, we would um, something from the outer space occurs. I don't know if it'll be Ison. I'm, I'm not sure. I've always believed there's two other planets. We're too short. Venus and Mercury have to cover two signs. So I've always believed there's two other planets, and and that may just be something that helps us uh, to understand the uh, the universe itself a little more. So that would not surprise me at all around the 28th if something occurs. Um, but I'm looking more at around the eclipses, uh, eclipse times, the third and the and the 18th. Well, it's interesting because all the planets in our solar system are going through some kind of planetary changes, and it makes you wonder if that there is something bigger out there, even perhaps a Nibiru or Planet X that's causing these changes. I've, I've felt that since I started this. It just the math don't add up, and it, the math adds up too well. Um, uh, you know, with the, the numbers. Uh, one through twelve uh, is you know twelve can be divided by one two three four six and twelve and uh, just too good mathematically not to have there's something else there I guess is all I'll say and I believe that from day one and it might be mm -hmm. on the other side of the sun and it stays there I'm not sure but uh, there's something else there there's two other things out there that we have not experienced or or we I have but we just can't recall it. Mm -hmm. I agree. And recently I just posted something on N5D.com about the Anunnaki and the 14 tablets of Anki. And I found that really fascinating um, because th there's, it tells an amazing story of how the Anunnaki came here and it basically created a genetic manipulation of our DNA to create these slave races to mine gold for them. And uh, then they ended up interbreeding with the people that are here to, and created like these but 
then again, part of me also says that we were seated here by various star nations because that would explain the differences in our blood types, the RH values, and ethnicities. This isn't necessarily an, uh, an astrology question, but what's, what's your inkling? What, what's your opinion on how we were seated here? Well, um, if you recall back when you were little, Greg or Kendra, and you just knew things or uh, you had dreams or there were things that were vivid that you never experienced in this life, um, I always look back at that and said, how in the heck did I know that? How did I understand mm -hmm. that? How, did, you know, how does that come to me? Why do I like it or why am I good at it? And astrology helped me realize that I've been here before. And, you know, you can go to your 12th house and you can go to um, where Saturn and Pluto are and you can really find out uh, in your fourth house and find out what you were, what you know, what you're drawn to, what you're good at. Um, and that really helped me then in my dreams and my meditation to come to the conclusion, and I'm, 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 I'm like you, Greg, that uh, we're probably not from here. We're helping here, and we've got to, to do what we can, do our part, and then we move to something else. And, and, you know, I have no problem talking about that with people, and I have really no problem. It resonates throughout me uh, that, yeah, we, uh, this is just a, one of, it's like a different stage in your life than this does before. We're just here for a period to uh, help and do what we can to move on. To lesson. I agree. I agree because that biblical tale of Adam and Eve, uh, well, you know, <laughs> the God said, God said, let us make man in our own image. Who is our? <laughs> right, right. You know, if you didn't have anything, how these, did you do that? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but even our own image, I mean, who are these gods, apparently? And in my opinion, that these gods that they're talking about are the Anunnaki and that, you know, it's it's not the creator, the ultimate creator that is all loving. The God in the Bible is an idiot, and if he and I ever come face to face, we're going fist to cuff. <laughs> that guy, he's a total asshole. Pardon my French. <laughs> anyway. the, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, just, you think if, if we took a baby today, let's just say we took a, a newborn baby and laid it out into the uh, wilderness, what would happen to it? Mm. You know, and so I always think about that. So how did this thing get started? We couldn't have started with a baby because it wouldn't have made it in the wilderness, right? Right. Sure. Well, you know, it's the whole so chicken and the egg thing. Absolutely. Where, where you absolutely. Say, every picture of Adam and Eve, they have belly buttons. Yes. <laughs> and, and it's and that's proof positive, right? So, I, you know, uh -huh. to me, it, it it unwinds itself pretty quickly. But I, you know, I just quietly just am amused as I listen to people talk for hours about what they know, um, versus not versus mm -hmm. you know versus what is you know. Well, you know, the the whole thing is to keep an open mind, and you know, I'm 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 sorry if I, I I offended any Christians or any other people of religious faith out there, but that's just my opinion, and uh, you know, I I do apologize for that. But uh, you know, here's another thing too. Saturn is known as Kronos or Father Time, and I find it interesting to see how the rings of Saturn are vanishing, and I was wondering if that had anything to do with the feeling of how time seems to be speeding up, or if it has anything to do with time disappearing at some point in the future. Yeah, Saturn is the planet uh, I follow the most in, in people's charts. And I've uh, once I you know got into astrology to a certain point, I realized that um, when, when we um, truly tap into our, our abilities, uh, we start spiraling, uh, and the spiral gets tighter and tighter. Um, and when we aren't, the spiral stays wide, right? And it takes us a long time to complete a cycle. And as you as you set time speeding up, I think that spiral is tightening up, right? Where we're going to get to that point of uh, if we're going clockwise in our spiraling, we hit that point where we we don't stop spinning, but we hit the, the the center point, and then we come out on the other side and we go counterclockwise, if that makes sense. So I think that's the point we're coming to, and that's why time sped up. I think we've learned our lessons. Our lessons are in front of us of what to do, what not to do, who we are, who we were, and who we can be. And that's really where we are right now. And it's that moment that it happens at one time that the awakening can occur and we move through something. And we need to do our parts individually. The masses will happen. Uh, if we all do our part, it's amazing what you'll see happens happen on the, on the, you know, the big stage. Mm-hmm. Now, is, is it possible that the disappearing rings of Saturn also represents the old structures fading away? Quite possibly. That could be what's happened, yes. So, mm -hmm. 
I've been watching that, and I, I can't – I have no data on that, but it's just it makes me realize that uh, Saturn, and I consider Saturn and Jupiter the kind of messengers. They break down the information the universe passes to us through Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus. And so if they're breaking down, it's like we're becoming – you know, we're becoming one with the universe. We're understanding that we don't need the messengers anymore, so to speak, or we don't need them as they have been. So, yes, I, I do think that's what's occurring. Hmm. And, Jim, you know, when we're, we're also talking about all of these um, planetary bodies that might be out there, um, Planet X or Nibiru and all of these um, things out there. Would you not, I mean, I, I personally just feel like maybe if, if there was something out there um, that large that we would see more significant changes, Earth changes on the planet taking place. I mean, we are seeing uh, quite a few. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, the massive amount of sinkholes that are occurring and, you know, right. all of these strange weather patterns and, and what have you. Um, don't you, I mean, how do you um, look at that? I mean, if there was a large object hiding behind the sun or if there was any, anything else coming that close to us that's, that, that's, you know, that large, that magnitude, wouldn't we already be experiencing or feeling some sort of major changes um, already? That's a great question. And this is, this is what's really got me perplexed. And I, you know, I, I, I can't maybe answer the question other than the fact that I can bring you questions that I've come to. And what if we have those mm-hmm. two other planets aren't on the same plane that we're on where, you know, they travel around the sun about the same, they, they go to the traffic of Capricorn Tropic of Cancer. That's their highest north and south um, mm-hmm. uh, transiting points. What if we have two that uh, come from the south to the north mm-hmm. that we can't right. see because, you know, they're, they're, they're below us. They're, you know, they're, they're, you know, so maybe in the North Pole or in the South Pole you can see them coming, but we can't see them now. What if that's what's happening? What if that's what's occurring? And these, they have their uh, transit, their uh, elliptic point, but it's north and south, and ours is going east-west. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, in other words, you're saying that these planets are already part of um, the the big picture. Anyway, just because we haven't acknowledged them or seen them or even knew that they were there, they were, they've always been part of, of, of how the system's working. So yeah. it wouldn't maybe yeah. cause as much of a – okay. All right, well, that, yeah, yeah, well, that and makes, we can't see know. it because it's coming from the south. Maybe it's coming from the south to the north, and so its path, mm-hmm. from our perspective, will we'll go from the south pole to the north pole versus you know the eastern to the west as we watch in the sky. All the planets travel on that eclip- elliptic point. Maybe this has an elliptic point that's through the galactic center. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it yeah. actually does. And, you know, and earlier we were talking, um, I had asked you a question about whether or not you felt that, uh, you know, there was a hero that was going to show up. Um, how much, how, you know, how much do you feel that uh, there are going to be extraterrestrials involved in uh, the future, uh, you know, coming events that are going to take place? I mean, how much influence and how much activity do you think that we might be able to see from uh, extraterrestrials? Yeah, I, I, I'm looking uh, mostly at, of course, I'm always looking at Pluto and Capricorn, but I'm looking at the Uranus transit through uh, Aries the last time. And that was in, mm-hmm. the 20s, uh, was in the 20s, late 20s and 30s. And um, if you look back and see the technology that was um, found by the Germans, um, that had to be otherworldly because we didn't have anything close to that. Um, I think uh, that was a Uranus transit through Aries. It was the late 20s through the mid-1930s. And uh, so if you look at the technology that they had, and, you know, they, they tried to suppress it, but slowly leaking out, I think that's coming again, and I think we're in it. So I think they're coming in some way, shape, or form. I think we're better now than we were as far as our abilities to sense and, and research and, you know, with all the things we have at our, our fingertips. So I think this time it'll be a, a, a full-blown event where most of us will experience some type of sighting or uh, experience of actually, um, you know, seeing something on, on Earth. So, and it, I, I do not at all think it's something that is definitely, uh, you know, that's detrimental or determined to be detrimental. I think it's it could be something that is going to remind us who we really are or what we're really doing here. So I don't think it's all it's negative at all uh, or has to be negative. Um, I think it's our star families coming back to check up on us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I think the one thing that, you know, we're trying to do all this technology, right, and the one thing they can't get, uh, that a human soul has, 
and that's the ability to love. They cannot get that. And so I, I think that's what the interesting thing is here. Is we, that's what we all have. And I'm not trying to get mushy, but I, I really think that's what they'll come back for. And that's what, you know, that's what will, uh, in the end, win out of this, all this. So. Well, it's not just that, but they say that the, uh, the people on Earth have what's called the genetic royalty of the universe because we are able to expre- express such a gamut of emotions. Matter of fact, I read an article somewhere where they were saying that the ETs, they like coming here and they, they like watching sports and movies because of the range of emotions that we show. Yes. We go from high yes. points to low points. It's like a roller coaster ride. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're yes. entertained by it. And apparently <laughs> other, other galactic uh, nations don't have this capability. It's more right. monotone or subdued or whatever. Yes. Yeah. I do think that's something they'll <laughs> never duplicate. And that's the beauty of who we are. And that's why our own heroes from within, we must show that. We must have that emerge. Um, and we mm-hmm. must live with that, you know, and then let it just be all that it can be. Now, they say that every every star system is at least a binary, and uh, a lot of people are speculating that perhaps Nibiru would be our second son, but I thought Alcyon was our second son, but yet th- does, doesn't Alcyon get any credit here? <laughs> I, it depends on uh, which way the wind's blowing, I think, with that. I... I, I it's so difficult to um, – because they're keeping so much from us. But I love being out where I'm not where there's any any light and just seeing the stars that are out there and seeing the – and just wondering what the heck's going on. And, and you wonder if, if it is a binary system. Everybody does have, you know, that one matching star, the one that they assist each other. Um, there's no pattern up in the sky for us to see that. So I don't know. I uh, that one has got me perplexed, Greg. I, I can't get deep into that because I just can't figure that out. I just can't put reason to that mm-hmm. or logic to that, if that makes sense. And wh- what about uh, the uh, Beetlejuice? Uh, supposedly, they said it could go supernova any minute. And, I mean, it, even if it did go su- supernova today, it meant that it went supernova hundreds of thousands of years ago, and we're finally seeing it right now. What kind of implications would that have for us? I think it shows his ability to, uh, when when all seems lost, there's something that comes up that, and that's what Pluto's trying to show us. And I think that's right in with that, is that uh, there is an ending, but that's just the beginning, if that makes sense. And I've been watching this Pluto thing. That's why I think there's going to be a lot of change come. Um, and I think that our planets close to us that we can see and watch are trying to tell us, and now we're getting this data from outside of that, and they're really starting to, I mean, they're doing a better job, I think, of filling us in. I just don't think they're telling us probably about ten percent of what's happening. Mm-hmm. Jim, there's a question from Sean Cohen in the chat room about Pluto being demoted from a planet status to an asteroid status. How does uh, how, or how do you see this? She's asking, how does your guest see this? But how do you see that? Asteroid yeah, I. Um, <laughs> my neighbors and I talk about that a lot because they, you know, they they're like CNNers and you know. Uh, NBCers and CBS people. I just, you know, there's too much proof of when Pluto has entered a sign, I've been able to study enough and go back enough that it has the power of a planet. And and uh, I, I think it is a planet. I think it moves like one. I think, you know, it's got a pretty uh, consistent uh, pattern as far as its transit uh, around the sun. And I, I do believe, I know we can't see it uh, from the naked eye, and, uh, we, we, you know, it's so far away, but I do believe and uh, its energies are powerful enough that it is still a planet. I, I, don't, I don't think the size matters. I think it's the transit that matters, in my opinion. And it does transit mm. the sun. It doesn't transit another, you know, a planet or another planet. It doesn't affect it too much on its uh, ecliptic plane. Makes sense. You were mentioning that you follow Saturn the most in people's charts. I find yeah. it interesting that because in astrotheology, Saturn is Satan, and the rings we exchange yeah. in wedding ceremonies represent the rings of Saturn. Yes. <laughs> You're exactly right. And I, uh, it, it took me a while because there's uh, Liz Green's one of them, and she's done a pretty good job of talking about the, uh, the negative side of Saturn. But if you look at your life, um, go back to, uh, and I know you're both over 29, um, to when you were 29 when Saturn came back to its natal position. Um, look at your 27, 28, 29 years, and then look at seven years after your 34, 35, 36, and uh, look what you did. Look how you matured. Um, really, mm-hmm. Saturn slices our life up in seven-year cycles, and what happens is within that cycle, we uh, the first phase of the seven years is 
um, discovery. The second phase is taking action. If you you know if you divide seven by by three, and then the third phase is observation, and you do that throughout your life. And when you really tap into the Saturn uh, cycles at twenty nine, fifty eight, and then of course you know your mid seventies, if you make it that long, you'll see that. Uh, you, you became very wise at that 29 and 58 year time, um, and you changed a lot in your life. You also did a lot at seven and 14 and 21, you know, and then you know, and then 36, 35, 36, 42, 49. You'll see that that's when you made a lot of your changes, or you woke up and start realizing things from perspective that was more of your perspective. And so I followed that, uh, and then I started studying Saturn because it was in between Saturn and Jupiter, in between the the uh, outer planets and the inner planets, and so then I started realizing the importance of Saturn and Jupiter, and, and that they had an effect of how uh, the universe was trying to bring us change, and then they were trying to bring it to us in ways that Saturn we had to do the work, and Jupiter we got to enjoy. Jupiter's kind of the fun planet, and so the more you study that, and look at that, Jupiter and Saturn have a bigger role than you think. Jupiter's a 12-year transit. Um, and look what you do every 12 years, you know, and then divide that by four. Look about every three years what you do. And, and then this astrology really gets fun because you start seeing little cycles within cycles that you're like, damn, that's right. How did that happen? And, you know, 36 is big because Saturn meets up with, with uh, uh, Jupiter, you know. So that's why I look at it, everybody's life around 35, 36. So I know a lot of change happens. So is that similar to the deacons in your chart or is that different? The decants? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, People pronounce yeah, that well, differently. The, yeah. Um, that's just That just breaks the sign down into 10 degrees. Oh, okay. Um, by three. Yeah. So, uh, you know, let's say you're a Taurus sun and, and um, uh, you know, you want to look at your progress and you're like a one degree Taurus sun and in 10 years it'll be at 11 degrees Taurus. And so then the first you're a Taurus Taurus, then you're a Taurus Virgo from 10 to 20, and then from 20 to 30, you're a Taurus Capricorn because that's all the Earth signs. It incorporates how you – it's the same principle of, of um, dis, you know, discovery, action, and then uh, observation. So it's the same principle of that, absolutely, but uh, I, I broke it down uh, into the quadrants of the chart. Wow. Okay. Well, you know, I know it's a bit taboo maybe to ask questions like this, but um, – you know, if a person wanted to know a, you know, maybe a, a just, or just make an inquiry as to what their longevity in this lifetime would be, um, is there a certain place to look for this information in, um, in, in our chart? Is there uh, a hint that you can give us to maybe what we can look at uh, to, to maybe foresee that? Yeah, yeah I, I think you can look where the sun falls because that's the giver of mm -hmm. life in your chart. That's where you, you're trying to illuminate that part and, that's where you need to. That's where you chose to express. Uh, so you want to look there, and then I think you want to look at uh, the, you know, the water signs, uh, the house of your past, and then the house of uh, death for this life, and then uh, your karmic house of uh, four, eight, and twelve. And I think that can give you a big piece of of what's going to happen. So four is. Well, your I past. appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. I, I'll never talk about the the points of death because we all have them, but I'll never talk about that. But yeah, I think you can see how uh, the fourth is your past, the eighth house is uh, death and rebirth, and the twelfth house is of karma. So you think you want to look at those? Hmm. All right. Now there was one other quick question that we I seen um, in the chat room, and I wanted to make sure I asked that before we started um, bringing in other callers. Um, and now I'm not seeing it. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. From Fitness Prudy, um, I'll ask my question here. He says, what does it mean if someone has no water signs in their planets? They have no planets in their water signs. That, then you want to find by house that your water signs fell and then uh, really uh, deeply look into that. Um, and, and the water signs, again, are Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces. I'm thinking they're all not thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'd like to say that their, you know, their emotions are, are limited. But if, if those uh, water signs fell in, you know, one, four, and eight, I think that they're going to be loaded with emotion. You know, so I, I want to be careful with that. But so I, I think we get two. A lot of time I read charts and I talk about, all right, your first house, they don't have any planets there, and like, oh, 
I'm like, but no, hold on a minute. Let's look at the sign there and then the planet that rules that sign. Where's that? And, you know, so you get a little more detail and then they start understanding it a little more. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to start bringing a few callers in, if that's okay with you, Jim. Yeah, uh, did we touch on topics, Craig, that you were open to? Or? Yeah, yeah. I've already uh, okay. told them ahead of time. To This is not about astrology, personal astrology questions. So. Okay. <laughs> and our first call- caller is Andrew, I believe. Andrew, are you there? Yes, I am. Let me get off speaker. Hold on a minute. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm off speaker. How are you doing? Great. How are you hey, doing? Andrew, how are you? All right. Well, um, it's pretty Cool that you mentioned uh, the thing about you think there might be something else in the solar system because um, before I get to my uh, question for Jim, I might want to point out that in a series of um, interviews that I watched on Alfred Weber's um, YouTube channel, he conducted with Andromeda Council contactee Talek. Talek said that some uh, brown dwarf that the extraterrestrials have put a cloaking device over is actually currently in an orbit between Venus and Earth that might have something to do with it. And he also says that Nibiru does exist, but it's out of its normal orbit. It's above the plane of the solar system. What's your take on that? It's very possible. I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to use all my faculties to pick that up. That, that would not surprise me at all. Um, I'm just trying to follow the information, so that's something new for me. So I'll, I'll, uh, what's the YouTube channel? It's um, Alfred Labermont Weber. Um, I don't know how to spell Labermont, but Alfred is his first name, and Weber, that's W-E-B-R-E. He conducted about five hours' worth of interviews with Andromeda Council, contact the Talek, and um, one of the, um, I think you'll be able to tell by the title, it talks about how, how a brown dwarf of sorts has moved into the solar system, and Alex Collier, I believe, talked about this as well, about an object moving into the solar system that we cannot see because it's concealed. So that might answer your question. Yeah, good. I'll, I'll look at that, too, because I'm always, I mean, I, I need to do, you know, research where I'm drawing, so I appreciate that. Yes, and um, since um, I'm on, I wanted to ask you, um, speaking of Alice Collier and speaking of Talek, they have both said that in around January 2014, um, Talek says the Andromeda Council contact you have expressly told him this, that in January of 2014, Earth will ascend into 4D, not 5D, 4D Earth. What's your take on that? Is there anything in the astro- astrological readings that suggests that Tolik and Alex Collier may be onto something? Um, there's going to be a, a new moon with uh, Pluto then, and and I always watch that uh, whenever a, a moon uh, squares, uh, poses, or a moon phase, uh, you know, important moon, moon phase squares, opposes, or conjuncts Pluto. So, uh, you know, I'm looking for things to ramp up. Uh, I think we'll get a glimpse of it here in, in about a week uh, when the 22nd of September comes in. And then late October, early November, I think we're really going to, uh, this thing's really going to ramp up. And it would not surprise me if, if around the, the early January something happens um, at all. So I, they may not be too far off from the truth. Um, I haven't uh, I'm just trying to. I'm trying to assess through, uh, you know, through the end of November first. So I haven't really got to January yet to get in detail, but I have been looking at that new moon. It's going to occur around the first, so uh, I, it could definitely be something big there. Um, and you know, uh, the 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 powers to be like to do things when everybody's not looking. And January first, nobody's looking. So. Yeah, that's true. And um, hopefully, Talek and Alex Collier haven't had their minds all warped by negative entities because the negative entities have done that. They did that to George Kavasilis before. So they might what, uh, what are they saying is going to happen? Um, all I know is that they said um, they can't pinpoint an exact date because higher ET consciousness entities, they don't follow time like we do, so they don't have exact time pinpoint. But they said around January 2014, um, Earth will ascend into 4D. And what's kind of confusing is um, some people like Dolores Cannon have said that we want to go into 4D, we'll go straight to 5D, because 4D, the only difference is the absence of time, and time is no is an illusion. So um, that means we'll just go to 5D. So it's kind of confusing there, but uh, Talek and Alice Collier have said it is 4D and not 5D that we'll ascend to in January 2014. Okay. Um, big events are coming, so that... You know, I'm not sure what that's going to entail, but I'm going to look into that one as well. So you, you always have good information, so I like that you call in. Very much uh, glad to help you there. That was pretty much all I wanted to point out. I appreciate that. Greg, what have you heard on that? 
They Thank bought. you so much, Andrew, for calling. Thank you. Pardon me? Have you heard anything on that? Because I have Well, not. you know, the thing about uh, you're probably asking the wrong person because I, you know, okay. I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, Tolek and channeling, and uh, I've okay. done my research on uh, Alex Collier. So if you Google Ralph Amagran, yeah. <laughs> you might find a few answers there too. Okay. But uh, okay. you know, I don't, I don't discount anything. I do like uh, Alex's uh, message. It's always positive, and uh, and sa same with Tolek. They, they both have very positive messages. But you know, buyer beware and use your own discernment. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree too. All right. Well, next we've got uh, Bang the Drum, and you're live on N5D Radio with Greg, Panther Jim, and Kendra. How are you? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They um, Yeah. No. A lot of people sometimes they they listen on either on cell or on online. So I guess that one's listening. So let's move on to uh, area code two zero eight. You're on N5D Radio with Greg Kendra and astrologer Jim Del Coley. Can we get your name? 208. 208. Going once. Going twice. Sold. <laughs> okay. And then uh, we can move on to area code 901. You're on N5D Radio with Greg Kendra and astrologer Jim Del Coley. Can we get your name? 901. Okay, this one's probably listening too, so we're going to put that one on hold. And I'm going to ask you, Jim, Uranus rules chaos, abrupt changes, radical disorder, disruption, rude awakenings, rebellion, storms, volatility, turbulence, and upheaval. And Pluto rules destruction, rage, death, shared resources, and corporations. We have another Uranus-Pluto square on November 1st. What can we expect? I think you just described it right. <laughs> <laughs> All no, in I, a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, well, I mean, I think that that does lay the groundwork for you know. Then you, 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 all those uh, energies are going to be involved, and then we go. All right. Well, Uranus is in the sign of Aries, which is about pioneering, new beginnings, change. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to head somewhere different. So Uranus is trying to pioneer for us, and we're trying to pioneer. And then Pluto's trying to show us um, through Capricorn, because Capricorn is what's been done and, uh, you know, what was built and then what what can sustain time. So Pluto's tearing down a lot of what we've done because it's, it's not good for the masses for long term or it doesn't, you know, coincide with nature. So we're trying to pioneer, um, and we're also trying to, like, you know, clean up. So in that, uh, that leads to a lot of destruction. Um, and... and you know, I'm, in, in astrology, nothing's a definite, uh, so to speak. I think we always have choices. But uh, when we get to a point where we just don't see it and we want to just not look at it, then I think the universe says, all right, you're going to look at this because I want to put it in a way that's going to make you address it. And so that's why I see uh, total chaos uh, that will be entering. And each time these uh, planets truly exactly square each other, which will be November 1st, 2nd, um, there's huge opportunity for that to happen. So. Uh, and then, of course, the new moon falls the next day on the 3rd. So uh, in Scorpio, which uh, Pluto rules of death and destruction, the eclipses are right there. So uh, I'm not saying we can avoid it, but I'm telling you that here's a huge opportunity for us to see things for as they are and address them uh, in our in our own lives and then in the world uh, around us and make a difference and change it. So if it needs to be destroyed, mm -hmm. let, it, let it or help it get destroyed and then build from that based on the lessons that you've learned. It's funny how people will look at Pluto and say, "Oh no, it's it's all about this, you know, this negative stuff." But it's such a blessing, and people really need to look at the positive side of it. How it is going to tear down religion, money, and government, and it gives us the opportunity yeah. to rebuild it back with something that's in the best interest of humanity. And, and Greg, the way Pluto lays itself out is, you feel like there's no hope at all, and then Pluto provides the miracle. So. Absolutely. I mean, you're going to look, we're all going to look at this and go, wow, there's no way out. And then Pluto's going to show us a way out. It's going to give us that miracle. And then we need to jump on it. And we'll be so ready to jump on it that when Pluto provides that, it's going to be every ounce of what we have will be put into moving forward. And it'll be so mm -hmm. beautiful and so magical that it, 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 we, just, we can't even describe it. And definitely we can't see it right now because Pluto still kept it hidden. 
Well, it seems like a lot of people are, are, are focusing on all the negative, but they, they don't even see the positive that's going on right now, you know, with all these um, yeah. conjunctions and alignments, you know, and I'm sure that's how the powers that be want it because, you know, when, when we live in that lower vibrational vibration of fear, then we're incapable of really seeing all the good that's going on and the possibilities that exist beyond that. Yes, and it goes back then to the simplest of equations of discovery, action, and observation. And we need to allow ourselves all that. So we're discovering all this. It does look negative, right? And, and then when we start taking mm-hmm. action, seeing we can do something about it, uh, and then we start feeling like, all right, and then we observe and say, all right, now I see why. As we discovered that, we had a lot of fear. That's natural. As we started to do something about it, the fear started to subside. And then as we observed it, we realized the phases we went through. And that's nature in its finest. There's three stages. It's real simple. You have to mm-hmm. have fear. People that say no fear, I'm like, you're not going to learn. You've got to bring fear along at some point and figure it out because you're going to break through the fear, you know, by through action. And then when you observe, you'll see why that had to happen that way. I kind of I kind of tell my spirit guides and guardian angels, I've had enough fear for now. Um, I'm ready for the good <laughs> and stuff. You, <laughs> and, and you may, and there's a lot of us that are, uh, well, I don't want to say us because I, I still have some fear that I deal with, but there's a lot out there that they've gone through the fear. And then you break, take fear and say, all right, I have to uh, discover it, then I have to take action against it, and then I have to observe it. So some people are doing that now, but some people are past that, and, and I'm okay with that. It doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, that's just where you are. So you're in that phase of observing, and you don't have to bring it along with you, you know? Oh, no, no. And once you, once you eliminate that fear from your lives, and this goes to everybody out there listening, you're going to find out that your dreams become prophetic almost because there's nothing left for your mind to think about it. And I usually... Yeah. And, and I, I took a uh, course in college on the psychology of sleep and dreams. And usually when you have dreams uh, that evening, it's usually of something that happened earlier that day and it comes out through metaphor. But once you eliminate all that fear, it, you're going to find that your dreams are going to be more prophetic and uh, futuristic. And, and occasionally mundane, you might just be walking your pat- deceased dog or something. <laughs> Right, right. Something right. along that line, but you know, it, it, it's it's really a blessing too. Once once you do overcome that fear. Yes. Yes. Now there there's a geocentric Uranus Pluto square in November as well. Can you explain the difference between a Uranus Pluto square and a geocentric Uranus Pluto square, and how that affects us? The geocentric square is when what in it's in December or in January? It, that's in November as well. Oh yeah, November. The year going to be. Um, I'm sorry. Mhm. Yeah, the Uranus Pluto square is on November first, and then I it, it's geocentric. I think somewhere in the middle of the month. Yeah, let me hold on a second. November. It'll be. Uh, that's where the sun, the center, is going to square. But um, I don't have that gray. That's okay. That's okay. Well, you got a birthday coming up here pretty soon. Yeah, I'm uh, October thirteenth. Uh-huh. I, I'm the uh, 19th, and uh, we have uh, we have another Libra in the room, in the chat room, Lori, oh, nice. Who, nice. whose birthday comes up in a couple weeks. Um, have you ever had a uh, sol- Have you ever done a solar return chart on yourself? Yeah, I have, and I. Uh, that's where I, I really started. Uh, the cycles really started playing themselves out. Is uh, if you want to do a solar chart on yourself, if you get an ephemeris, just count how many days from the day you were born, um, you know, pull the, the ephemeris up for whatever day and year you're born, and then just if you're 45, count 45 days away from that and pull that chart. That's going to tell you uh, your, your kind of over or outline of the year you're getting ready to experience it. It's interesting because you can also take that backwards and see how you, your life was in the past. And, and what I find on the solar return charts with people is I'll match them up with a transiting planet chart. And what I find is... Uh, it really helps them kind of, it kind of eases them because the solar returns that kind of a snapshot, but it's for the whole year. And so it helps them kind of understand that, all right, here's the, the kind of yearly energies you'll be dealing with, and then you can take the transiting plan and say, all right, now here's days that it'll be excited or it'll be, you know, trying to um, uh, restrict or, you know, or opportunities or, or, you know, time to rest. And so it really helps the person and realize that there's a way bigger picture here. Don't get caught in these moments when some of these planets are just trying to light you up and, you know, and get you off your game. So I love mm-hmm. the solar returns. I think that they give you an outline outla- um, for the year. 
and everybody should do, they should do that around your birthday. Mm -hmm. Kendra and I both have, both have had a uh, solar return chart reading by a woman named Lavendar, who is one of our guests here on N5D Radio, and she mentioned mm -hmm. that there's a 10-hour window where you're – you you can your your ability to manifest is like a thousand times stronger. I believe it's from the five hours before and the five hours after the the the, the time you were born. Would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would. I, I would because the planets come within you know the degrees of the same the, the time that they were at birth, and so uh, that's always the closer you get to the exact time, uh, the more powerful. So I would absolutely agree with that because the sun is. Uh, in a chart, the sun's the um, significant point of what it is you uh, are trying to accomplish. So it's kind of your objective or your pathway that you're laying out this life. The sun's trying to light that way. And, and you know, so you took the, whatever sign the sun falls in, you took that kind of way is how you're going to overall try to deal and learn. So for us Libras, we're, we're seeking balance this life um, in whatever screwed up way it is. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Kendra recently had her solar return chart. Kendra the Virgo. <laughs> what was your... Yeah, we're not big on Virgos, are we? Uh, <laughs> hell no. But uh, what's interesting is uh, you know, Kendra has her Pluto and Libra. My Pluto's in Virgo. Yeah, here we are. We, we, we work great together on the radio. But then again, I'm not married to her. Good luck with that, Lars. <laughs> Her husband is also also has Pluto in Virgo, and she has you know okay. Pluto in Libra. So it's it's really interesting. Anyway, Kendra, you recently had a solar return chart experience. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I I would be um, you know very happy to do that because I thought it was one of the most wonderful experiences that I've had in a very very long time. And you know when you're talking about that ten hour window of power, you know not I I actually felt it. I don't know if, if you felt it, Greg, but I actually felt it. I felt empowered more so than, um, I mean, when I went outside and I sat down, and I, and I did, I took this very seriously. I sat down and I, and I began um, doing my manifestation. I wrote down a list of everything that I wanted for the upcoming year to take place, um, and I meant it when I wrote it. I mean, it, it came from, from my, the deepest parts of my being, and I put that out there, and uh, I just felt almost like at, like there was an open door or communication, just a channel open. And, yeah. you know, I, I felt that before somewhat, but that particular time, it just felt like the door grew from this little tiny itty-bitty thing to this huge, just gigantic, you know, <laughs> Uh, opening in the sky, and it just flew right out of me. And um, I would have to really suggest it to anybody, you know, that has a birthday coming up um, to have it done because I, I thought it was amazing. And I and I am almost kicking myself in the rear end for waiting 36 years in order to uh, to, to experience this. But yeah, I, I thought it was extremely empowering. Um, it's it stayed with me. The the memory of the experience and the memory of what I did that day is staying with me also. Because um, not only did I uh, write down all of my intentions for the upcoming year, I also took Lavendar's advice and I um, burnt the, uh, the the paper. I sent it up, um, you know, uh, in a form. And this is more, you know, a spiritual thing, I guess, you know, a connection with what we're doing here. But, you know, I sent that out um, to the universe, and I feel like it was just literally, you know, putting that, uh, you know, message in a bottle and just chunking it out in the middle of the universe. You know, it felt great. Mm -hmm. So, right. Um, yeah, I, I had an excellent experience. I thought it was great. <laughs> That's why I talk to people about um, the new moons and the, and the full moons. The new moons are the moon and sun together, and and if you can get cl as close to the exact time, um, the moons are past in astrology. It's what you brought with you, what you know, and the sun's where you're trying to go. They're together from our perspective. So why would you not want all that you worked on to be working with where you're trying to go? Um, and so that's why I encourage people on the new moons to do just what you did on that solar return with the sun um, and put it out into the universe. Let them know, hey, I'm ready to utilize uh, the work that I've done and the abilities that I have with where I'm trying to go. And so I do that every month. I see, you, know, you get 12, sometimes 13 in a year. And then on the full moon, mm -hmm. taking your action. That way you can see clearly action being taken or because the moon and sun are so far apart. You can clearly say 
if, hey, I'm doing something that's repetitive and I need to get off this cycle, that means you're going backwards towards the moon or no, this is something new. I need to keep going here because this is on, this is, I'm back on my path and I'm moving forward. And then all the planets have cycles. So it, it's really key for you to look and see when all of them cross over your sun or cross over a critical you know, moon point or an asc- ascendant point um, to help you get in rhythm with the universe like you mm-hmm. just did on your birthday. So, and you're 36. I think that's, uh, I think that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Remember I taught 35, 36 is a big year. It's a, it's a, it's a Jupiter return and it's a Saturn square first Saturn square. So you're really like, no, I gotta, I gotta figure this out. And you're really trying to do that. <laughs> yeah. That's what exactly what I'm feeling inside too. So thank you for that. <laughs> What you're doing subconsciously, your your energetic makeup or your magnetic makeup is in line then with the planets. And so this is something that's coming from the soul. It's saying it's time, and so you're doing it. So, you know, good for you for not fi- fighting that off and pushing it away. Yeah, I'm definitely trying to embrace things um, that are, are taking place. Yep, trying to let down some of the walls for sure. Now, is there anything yep. different um, or anything else that you can re- recommend doing during uh, a solar return? Um, I always look at a solar return as I, I want to look at um, planets that are uh, heavily kind of, um, they uh, have a heavy influence on us. So I always want to know where Pluto is because that's the uh, the reflector of the soul or, or you know, it, it's the kind of keeper of the soul. And I want to know where Saturn is. And then for fun, I, I, you want to know the planet that rules your sun sign. So for you, it'd be Mercury. You want to watch where that is being a Virgo. So know the ruler of your sign mm-hmm. and then, Follow those other two planets and then, of course, the sun, and, and just know where they are by house and sign and work on that part of your life uh, when any when a moon comes, when a solar return comes. You want to know where Saturn is because that's where you're really learning your lessons. Um, so if Saturn's in your, your seventh house and, and your solar return's in your fourth house, uh, you're really finding yourself. Uh, um, but Saturn's saying it's through others that are going to help you find yourself, if, if that makes sense, because seventh house is the partner's. I'm curious, Jim, if, if somebody is a triple sign, and, and for example, I'm, I'm a triple Libra, what does that mean? Okay. Well, it means that uh, the sign of Libra, I really study what, uh, you know, the energies that help define Libra. And what I'd be real careful of is that uh, you chose to have the sun, moon, and ascendant there in Libra. Um, and mm-hmm. so the, the key for you is that you're trying to learn balance. And, and so you took all the powerful points in the chart and put them all in that because it's about seeking balance. And so you're going to seek a lot of imbalance. You're going to find a lot of imbalance that will help you learn balance, <laughs> if that makes sense. And you have a lot of people that will be, be conflicting, but it's because you are learning to the core what balance is, if that makes sense. I, oh, God, I'm still learning because I'm, I'm a workaholic. And the thing I realize, and I'm trying to do this more often, is to take time out for myself to appreciate life. Right instead of working 12 to 15 plus hours every day. But I feel like everybody in this genre, I feel like there's a, a pressure and, and an obligation. And most of us are service to others' people, so we put everybody else ahead of ourselves, and it's really hard to find that balance. Right. And, that, and then, it, it, you know, in the end, uh, I think you said the, the key words there that a Libra truly needs to learn is that you've got to insert yourself in that equation because you always don't, you, you, you do that last, I guess. You, you want to please, mm-hmm. you want to help, you want to do your part. And at the end, it's like, oh, yeah, i gotta, I got to do something for me. What matters to me? And so, yeah. you know, that, that's probably the biggest thing is inserting that in that equation of uh, seeking balance. Well, people, people think I'm being sarcastic when I say I forced myself to go to the beach today. But I, right. I really, I do. I have to force myself to get out. Like earlier today, I, I, I play guitar. So I went outside and I just, I, I jammed for about, an hour and a half, and I, I made myself do that. You know, I, I got to find that balance, and I realized that. But it's so hard to do when you put when you put others ahead of yourself. Yes, yes, and, yeah, and, and it's just a process. So remember, always remember we talked about tonight. It's uh, discovery, action, and then and then observation. So let yourself go through that process, if that makes sense. So what what Libra challenges are you finding? Uh, I, I do the same things. What I, the first thing I notice is what I attract is because uh, I'm a giver and I attract takers. So the first thing, that, and I'm, I'm getting really good in the phase there uh, where I'm, I've gone through the discovering of that. Now I'm taking action. Of, uh, I'm really sniffing out a taker quick, if that makes sense. And uh, I don't let them pull from me and take from me uh, because <laughs> I'll give them everything I have and then I'll be exhausted, you know. 
And oh, so yeah. I'm, I'm in the action phase now, and, and I'm not to the observation yet, but I'm in the action phase where, all right, I've discovered it, I, I, I see it, and now I've taken action on it, you know? Yeah, the, the, the type A control freaks seek us out. <laughs> yes. They love us. <laughs> I mean, they, we don't even have to say hi to them, and they already know. You know what I'm saying? I mean, oh, yeah. just, they just know, oh, yeah. you know, so. They do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh geez. I wasn't I wasn't talking about you, Kendra. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, well, Jim, I I have something I wanted to ask you. You know, I I think everybody is really loving and looking forward, you know, to the the age of Aquarius. I mean, that's the big you know golden apple in the sky, whatever you want to call it. And you know, many people you know consider us being right now on the threshold of this new age, having you know. Mm-hmm. To, you know, having it come into uh, existence. Now, ha- have you ever flipped forward or looked ahead, and can you see any major changes or differences in the way that uh, um, the astrology is panning out during that period of time when the age of Pisces leaves and Aquarius begins? I mean, we're still going to have the same planetary influences during that time, right? Yeah, uh, I, there's just like an advancement, because so I think we're also in a 26,000-year cycle as well that uh, mm-hmm. really gets realized now as we hit the the, the sign of Aquarius. So, uh, you know, what I see as I look forward is uh, it, it'll be nothing like it is now. Um, it, you know, a lot of people like to say that, but, but it, in that I mean that uh, all the faculties and all the potentials of an individual are, will be realized and they'll be used. Um, now, I know how nature works and, and, and life feeds on death and death feeds on life. Um, and, and so, you know, we, because we move around, we need something to feed us and we need something to keep us going. So, uh, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's not going to be like some of these people think that nothing dies and nothing. No, I think that's still going to be the process, but we'll tap into so much more. And so when we encounter somebody that we had a past life with or, or that, you, um, you know, um, maybe our partners had a past life with, uh, we'll be able to pick up on that energy and we'll be able to understand it clearer and we won't fight so much we won't have fear involved so much because you know we're going to have this uh, understanding that's to a level that that you know we just can't explain right now and i think that's what you know it's me i'm looking in the mid mid 20 20 you know 2020s and then uh beyond there uh because pluto leaves capricorn gets into aquarius and then uranus gets through into taurus and and moving into gemini where we're going to really start putting the pieces together on all this so I sure hope I'm around to see some of the uh, the, the the good stuff coming through, you know. <laughs> or you know, I, mean, well, I, I know that there, there's good to be seen now, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I want to see, you know, that uh, beautiful scenic view of you know everybody getting along and loving on you know each other and everything, and you know I, I want to see that happening, you know. Sure, and I, you know, I look at a lot of um, uh, you know what what I'm going through, what I've had to go through, and and. I may not be there for that, but I don't have a problem because um, some of the most uh, wonderful um, discoveries I've made in this and, and the aha moments um, are worth that for me, if that makes sense. So n- nothing wrong with seeing that, but uh, some of us, our lessons are going to be to get us there, I guess, or try to get us there. Right now, everybody that's listening, we're blazing the trail for others. So you know, yes. when it's all said and done, whether we see the end result or not, People are going to look back at everyone that's here right now and see us all as the mothers and founders and mothers and fathers of the golden age. You know, so we're, yeah. we're laying the path, and we can still observe what's happening when we cross over to the other side to say, "Yeah, yeah. you know, I was part of that." Mm-hmm. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. And I, if I'm the first one to go in that process, I'm okay with that as long as uh, I did everything I could. You know, and if I do that, I know I'm, you know, I'm all. I'm good. So, and, you mm-hmm. know, we're all just a, we're all just a part of this, and, and we all got we got to remember remind ourselves of that at times, you know. Yeah. Well, I know my motivation and inspiration comes from my children, and wanting to know in my heart that uh, I've done everything I possibly can to create a brighter future for them. So that's right. Uh, um, yeah, that's my that's prize. That's very important that I for a Virgo, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> As is everything else. Yeah, they're, they're, they uh, they like to try to fix everything. I'm not going to deny that. Uh-huh. Now, now, is there any connection between the Golden Age, the Age of Aquarius, and the precession of the equinoxes? 
I think so. I, I think they're, um, uh, I, I, you know, precession of the equinoxes equal that approximately 26,000 year cycle. And I, I think that that golden age is the realization of all that uh, was sought, um, good and bad, and then what we learned from it, and then how we made uh, and got back in line with nature with the knowledge that we had. You know, we had the power to try to uh, overcome it or, or to defeat it, and we realized that, that that isn't power at all. You know, there's so many limiting things that, so we got back in line with nature itself. And so I think that's what the golden age is all about, and, and things get back to be simplified, you know? Mm-hmm. And what, what, what can you? I've, I've been really uh, curious about this. I actually, you know, wrote a, a brief article on this, and I was hoping that maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on it. Could you give the listeners like a brief synopsis of the Pluto in whatever generations? And start, let's start out with uh, Pluto and Cancer. What was okay. that generation about? Pluto and Cancer. Uh, and these would be for um, people born around 1913 to 1938. And uh, because Pluto is um, is the soul and all of its lessons, and, and you have all the, the knowledge tapped in, your t- your ability to tap into all the knowledge is there. So all the experiences are there as well, good and bad. What scared you? What made you uh, excited, happy, joyful? Um, you know, what made you mad or, or uh, extremely enraged? All that happens with Pluto. And so when we get into the, when it fell into the sign of Cancer, which is 1913 to 1938, those are people that. Um, could tap into the past because cancer rules, uh, the moon rules that, and it's the past. And so they really, like, had a sense for what was. And so change for them was tough. And, you know, you mm-hmm. look back on that time frame, and they went they went through the stock market uh, crash, uh, World War I, uh, the Federal Reserve was created. And you look at that, and that must have been terrifying for those people because they had a, a fond memory of, of things, and they really had a good time. You know, they had a sense of what, how real good things could be, so they didn't want to let things go. So it was, they got things stripped away or their freedoms taken or, you know, their ability just to be and let their emotions flow, um, that really made them hold on to that even more. So when we mm-hmm. got through the, the, the World War, we got through the Great Depression, these people wouldn't give a thing up. You know, they held on to everything they remembered. Um, they were very good at, like, uh, saving and keepsake and, uh, you know, they were very, it's a very interesting group because there's one, there's not many of them left. And two, um, they were very fond of, uh, like the nature and tradition and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, now a lot of these, a lot of these people are, are parents or grandparents. And yeah. like you said, they're, they're set in their ways. And what we're seeing is a lot of them are also world leaders in religion, banking and government. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, because also a cancer individual, when they buy into things, uh, it's with everything mm-hmm. they got, right? So if you can get a, a cancer sun sign or, you know, uh, you know, at some prominent planets or ascendant or moon there or whatever, uh, if you can get them to buy into something, they're, they're in with everything they got. And the powers mm-hmm. of being knew that when they started these things. So they, they brought them in a way that you can't live without it, and so they sold it to them. And, you know, cancers, they're, they're buyers. If you get them bought, you know, if you get them emotionally attached, they're going to buy, and they'll, and they'll stick to it. And these people knew that. That's why they started what they did back then. That's why they had the, the Great Depression. They had the stock market crash because they knew mm-hmm. that these people were going to, you know, through thick and thin, they, you know, they were going to do it. They were going to do what they had to do to make it. They were tough. This, that group was tough. Oh, yeah, definitely. And what I'm finding, too, this was like one of the hardest groups to crack in the awakening, but what I'm seeing is that they're awakening right now, and they're as as much as they're set in their ways. I'm actually talking to my parents about all the stuff that we're talking about here on N5D Radio, and they're listening now with an open mind. Uh, Pluto is in Capricorn, and that's opposing Pluto and Cancer, so they're seeing things from both ends of the spectrum, and so it's very uh-huh. good for them to hear what you know what they wouldn't want to listen to. Now they're listening because they're like, wait a minute, here I'm not a bought in too, I might have bit too hard on that. I might have bought in too much into the, you know, that. And, and so that's why it's a very uh, good time for them to awaken because Pluto is opposing that their natal Pluto position. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, opposing uh, the U S is sun sign. So we're seeing what the U S has done wrong and it's being exposed. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So for the so. people listening, we're going to, we're going to cover your generation here as we move on, but we're going to go on to the Pluto and Leo generation, yes. which uh, has a lot of the, uh, 
the hippies and the, 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 the people that really kind of laid the groundwork for the Pluto and Virgo generation. But can you tell us a little about the Pluto and Leo generation? Yeah, Leo uh, is ruled by the sun, so these people came to improve or, or make things better. They were going to be bigger than life. They were going to show that, uh, you know, uh, we can make this work, and by God, we can do anything. Uh, Pluto and Leo people were 1938 to 1957. Um, and so what they did was that the Pluto is to be on stage, center of the stage, the, the, the leading actor or actress um, or the pitcher or the quarterback. That's the, the Leo guy. So Pluto and Leo are... You know, we're going to show the world what we can do. And so they did uh, on a grand scale. Look what we created uh, or look what we refined through that period, you know, from 38 to 57. Look how this country grew. Look how uh, possibilities came into play. And that I really attribute that to Pluto and Leo people. Um, they were going to be bigger than life. And by God, uh, no matter what, they were going to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I love a lot of the things that uh, Pluto and Leo generation stood for, but I found that they lacked the organizational structure to really follow through on what they set forth. Right. Yeah, Pluto and Leo, are, it's about, you know, we got to make this bigger. It's got to be grander. But uh, th- this is the point of creation, right? And so when you create something, you got to fix it. And that's why Virgo comes after Leo, because they're the fixers, right? So uh, All right. they created, they made it grander. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they were the star of the show, but uh, behind that, somebody's got to uh, keep the notes and keep them on schedule and schedule them and have their hair done. And you know what I'm saying? So the Virgo, <laughs> Pluto and yep. Virgo came next. And Greg, that was our generation, which was uh, 1957 uh-huh. to 71. Um, and what we did right. was uh, Virgo is the finalizing of the work that's done from the inside. Um, and so what we had to do is we, we, we're out perfecting now. We're, we're uh, realizing that uh, you just can't drink and, and – you know, carry on and party uh, because at some point somebody's got to be responsible because the next generation then will falter if we don't, right? So then we got to come in and try to pick up some of the pieces. It's not that we can't have fun. It's not that we can't party. And But we, we had a sense of, wait, we, we have to piece this thing back together here because we got a little blown apart here by the Pluto and Leos. And so that's what the Pluto and Virgos did then is they came mm-hmm. in and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We got a karma equation here because Pluto rules the soul, so it rules karma. And we want to make sure that we put, almost pay it forward, so to speak. And that's what that group did from 57 to 71. The Pluto and Virgo generation, you know, we're, we're basically the first generation, the first full generation who are the trailblazers of everything that's going to be happening from this point forward. We're, we're, we're laying the groundwork this entire generation for the Pluto and uh, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, and, and Capricorn. And uh, you know, we're, we're basically taking what Leo started, and we're, we're going full force, you know, uh, 100 miles an hour, and uh, nobody can stop us, that kind of thing. Right. You know, Pluto and Virgo, uh, what, what we're doing is we're perfecting now. So what we're doing is saying, if I do this, what does that do to – if I do X, what does that do to Y? And so we're realizing that what we do to the planet and what we do to each other and mm-hmm. what we do, you know, to if we have too much waste. And, and so we're, we're really consciously doing that. And don't, don't get yourself the powers to be know that we're now in that, that uh, powerful time where we have a say-so and we're wise enough, you know. So they've worked on us about recycling and, you, you know, and they're making money on us because they're realizing that, hey, these people are very conscious and I can make them – feel like the, the the culprit here if I just point enough times at them and so then they'll go fix it and they know this and so that's what they're doing mm-hmm. yeah now uh, Kendra's generation is the Pluto and Libra generation what can you tell us about that that's the 71 to 84 and that's where divorce uh, took off right the uh, Libra rules partnerships it rules balance that one seeks and so uh, it also rules allowing somebody in the inner circle so when Pluto got in Libra the natural progression was then, all right, the, uh, the, the cancer people, like, really bought in and, and you know, they, they um, uh, owned what was, what was um, coming to them at the time. And, and they really, like, put a good effort forth. The, the Leos took and uh, expanded that to an unbelievable uh, level, and then the Virgos had to clean all that mess up. And now the Libras are like, all right, now since we've gone through those phases, I can now uh, experience, take things and experience them through others. So it's about getting out and showing that the soul needs to get out and they need to experience others. It's very important that uh, as they're doing this, they're, they're trying to, they're 
really wanted to please, and, and the key for this generation is you, you end up having to please yourself. You do need others, but you really ought to work on pleasing yourself. And Libra also beautifies, um, and it rules fairness. So uh, they're working on all this, but what I would remind all these Libra and or Pluto and Libra people is be fair to yourself first, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I think they, they seek the hero, and I heard Kendra say it. I'm not saying she seeks that, but I think they're looking into others of what can – what the possibilities can can be be because of the fact that they're so it's so important for them to merge with someone other than themselves. But realize that if they become their own own hero, they're going to attract another hero, and that's what really I think the lesson is from that group. Um, as they become then the next influential agent, you know, in five, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of us uh, who are Pluto in Virgo and Pluto in Libra, we have children that are Pluto in Scorpio. So, yes. What can you tell us about the Pluto and Scorpio generation? A very, very, very powerful generation. Pluto rules Scorpio, and so they've had to go through a lot. They uh, they got um, introduced to a lot of uh, what life has to offer, so to speak, early in life. Things change for them tremendously uh, from a technological side, from a uh, you know just a, a understanding nature side. Um, and so what, what they're doing is they're, they, they needed that because they had to experience it. And I hate to say that uh, out loud because then people say, all right, good, I'm, I'm glad I did that. Um, but they experienced a lot of things that maybe they shouldn't have uh, experienced. They experienced divorce because it really took off. Uh, and they just experienced it. Uh, there's a whole lot of new drugs. There's diseases. All kinds of stuff came up to Pluto and Scorpio um, during that time, especially early in that phase. And so they really had to grow up in an environment that, a lot of us were didn't have because it was kind of uh, kept from us. So, but in saying all that, this is probably the most powerful group, and and we're starting to see that now as they get into their, you know, uh, late twenties, thirties, and uh, getting right into thirties, and they're getting a Saturn return. They're really growing up fast. So this group's going to be off the charts, ridiculously unbelievable, and they'll be the ones that as we get, you know, we carry them to that next frontier. They're going to take us, you know. Uh, where we can go, I think. There'll be that initial group to take us uh, quite a way. And that age group goes from what year? 80, 84, 84 to 96. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the following one, the Pluto and Sagittarius group, what can you tell us about them? Well, it's from 96 to 2008. And Sagittarius rules the ninth house or the higher mind or the philosophical one. So as we do our part, Libra, uh, the Libra people, Pluto people do their part, and then the Scorpio people do theirs, the Sagittarian ones are going to take us, like, where the potential is. Their, their, their philosophy is there. You know, they, they can handle things that we, you know, would make us, uh, you know, stop dead in our tracks and really have to assess. They can handle them, and they're going to really take us to where I think the human race can go. I do think the powers to be know that. They understand that. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that has a child in this age group, uh, and in the Scorpio, uh, Pluto Scorpio age group, you know, you sense when they're born, they're different. They're not like us at all. So you want to watch mm -hmm. them and their addictive tendencies. You want to watch them, you know, as they grow and just let them grow, allow them the space, but protect them while they need it. Um, and then when they get, you'll know when they can protect themselves uh, and, and you can just let them fly. But th these two groups are just off the charts ridiculous um, with their uh, abilities uh physically and non-physically, if that makes sense. One of the things I tell people, too, is um, to allow your child to fall so they know what it's like to pick themselves back up again. They're going to learn so much more that way. Well, the hidden message and, there, Greg, which I always try to talk about is you're basically, if, if you don't let them fall, you're basically telling them you don't believe they can pick themselves up. You're not saying it out loud, but that's the hidden mm -hmm. message you're giving them, that, no, you can't <laughs> yeah. do it, i got to help you. You know, so, uh -huh. uh, and we got to look at that stuff because these, these kids can overcome a lot and we got to let them, you know, we, we've got to allow them that, like you said. A friend of mine, I, I used to do that all the time when my daughter was two, three, four years old. She'd be about ready to fall and I'd be there to catch her. And a friend of mine said something. She said, she said uh, you know, someday your daughter's going to be in her 20s and living in California and she's going to tell her friends, watch this, and she's going to fall backwards and out of nowhere I'm going to scoop her up. <laughs> it, it finally it finally hit home. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I do have to let her fall. So the, 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 the following generation, which is where we're at right now, um, is the Pluto in Capricorn generation. So can you tell us about that, you know, uh, when it started yeah, this, and this, what they're about? 
this started in uh, early '08, and this group, uh, uh, and, and we we're not seeing it yet because they're they're so little. Um, but this group is going to uh, they're going to rewrite the rules, and and they're not going to let this stuff happen that happened, and they're going to make sure that uh, what they do withstands the test of time. So they're really going to put a whammy on. Um, to make sure that in the process of our evolution that we minimize uh, what the control is or what the control was um, that, you know, was it they had um, in, in forming where we got to today. So they're really going to put a whammy on them. So it's going to be very interesting um, to watch this group as they grow up. And they're, they're way too little now, but uh, you can look at, look at, I have a younger daughter and some of the kids coming up are, uh, off the charts. I mean, it's it's wonderful to watch, and, and I know what their potential is, you know. And that, and, and that's going to take me. If you give me a second, everybody should should uh, take. If, if you're having a child, get a chart read. That you don't have to go to me. Go to somebody that uh, is you refers you you they refer you to them, and let them read that child's chart because this is a very powerful time, and I want the human race to be what I think it's going to end up being. And and that is that we uh, there's a lot of ease and there's a lot of simplicity, um, and we we all live uh, in a way that we we do things together, not to dominate each other. And and this group's going to make sure that doesn't happen. So we got to really get those, um, and 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 you know make sure that we make sure those kids have that opportunity from day one, and, and we don't stifle them if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, the following one would be the Pluto and Aquarius, which I don't think I'll be around for. But uh, what what can you tell? Uh, that that'll be our children's children's uh, generation. So what, what can yeah. you tell us about that? Yeah, that's going to be in the mid. Uh, I think it's twenty twenty four. Get through. Let me make sure. Um, yeah, late twenty twenty four, and and uh, they're the ones that then uh, when when the Pluto and Capricorn uh, children uh, are influences there to make sure that we get back in line with nature and, and that, uh, you know, we're, we're living parallel to it. The Pluto and, and Aquarius are going to just be off the charts about now how can we take this to tomorrow, and, and they'll really be outside the box thinking. So the innovation and the creation and the, the unbelievable um, events that happen there are just going to be off the charts ridiculous because I think we'll have laid the groundwork to make them safe, and then they're really going to take us to tomorrow. So I think space travel and you know, just uh, no no concept of time. All those things will be gathered then uh, when Pluto goes into um, Aquarius, and that it'd just be a wonderful time. And Greg, I, I like you. I, I'm not pretty sure I'm not going to be here, and I don't have a problem with that. But um, that'll be an mm -hmm. amazing time. So I'm hoping I make sure all my kids get there, and that's why I'm trying to do my part now because yeah. uh, it is about continuing the human race in the end. You know. Yeah, and at some point they're going to be listening to this saying, wow, our great-grandparents were so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and smart, too, I hope. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I think that this is also, um, you know, why our public school system is failing so miserably with these new kids, too, because they're, I mean, I, I, <laughs> they don't want to be there, you know, and, and the instant no. that they don't conform to, you know, this old program and everything else, you know, they want to stick them on, you know, medication for all these, you know, ridiculous, you know, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> disabilities, all these learning attention deficit disorders, you know, I, I've even had a teacher say, well, you know, the, the reason why, you know, he can't focus on this is because I know he doesn't have any interest in it, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's the problem, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, if, yeah. if I see this, what my observation was the, the public school education system that teaches exactly backwards. They want you to observe first, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you just observe at the end. You, you know, so I think they screw it up to a degree, if that makes sense. You got to discover first. And you have to observe to a degree to discover, but uh, you're, you're supposed to be overseeing it and seeing what's done at the end. So they make you do that. And so you don't want to do it because uh, you, all your instincts are then told to not work, you got to work how somebody else tell you know, and it screws the whole process up. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that, that the earth is going through a birthing process right now? I think the, our, 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 uh, our whole um, Milky Way is, yes, and uh, mm -hmm. that's why everything's sped up. And I think I said, as I said, I feel like we're spiraling and uh, time's sped up to where it's, it's not going to matter, time's not going to matter because um, you're getting, you know, you're, all your senses are becoming more and more aware, and the more you can stay clean. That, yeah, I think the more that you're going to go through this process with flying colors, 
Um, and you may not make sense to a lot of people, but you can't worry about that. You, you've got to go with what you know, and you're going to see that as you do that, more and more is going to just make sense, and, you know, just it's going to be easier and simpler and faster, and, and as you continue that, those people that don't believe or want to try to keep them, that will start falling by the wayside. So, so if the Earth and the Milky Way galaxy is going through a birthing process, then would it make sense that the universe is going through one as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a whole... We're, we're going through something to come out on the other side. So, yeah, it's a whole, like, it, it is a birthing process. The awakening is, get, is coming. It's here, and we're in the moment, you know. And that, that for me, it's so, it, it can't happen fast enough because you just feel it and you just know it everywhere you turn, you know. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else in the stars other than Pluto and Capricorn and the Uranus-Pluto square that indicates a continuing paradigm shift in awareness and consciousness? Yeah, I, I, and I think I hope, and I hope we all um, uh, live with the fact as we move forward that um, you don't have all the answers, and, and nor do you ever need them. What you need to do, though, is use your faculties and and be like a child whenever an event happens. We're going to struggle a lot this fall. There's going to be a lot mm -hmm. of events that are totally chaotic, but it's time. We need that. It's the only way uh, it, to healthily look at that. It's the only way we can get the masses to understand because they're so far on. We need them, man. I mean, I want everybody to make yeah. it through this. I don't care how evil they are. I want them to awaken and, and see, you know. So uh, as we struggle, as we go through, know that this is how it has to be. And and, and what you got to do is discover everything you can at this point, even if it's what you don't like and don't need, so you can smell it, taste it, and know it. And uh, so then as you experience it again, um, you'll know what it is, and you'll know what to do with it immediately and not have fear. So, you know, I, I, we're in that time that, uh, you can change your past by going back over things you, you and using what you know today and take yourself to tomorrow um, without a, a hitch or without a problem or a glitch. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. What is the biggest lesson that you've learned about yourself through astrology? That um, the human experience is a beautiful thing when you realize that uh, a mistake is probably your most valuable lesson. Uh, we're, so, we're taught so much to, you don't want to be wrong, you don't want to make a mistake, you don't want to you know, look like a fool, and that's the farthest thing from the truth. When those things happen to you, you learn so much so fast. And if we could healthily teach that to our children growing up, um, that this place would turn in a minute because everybody would understand that they don't have to be the best. They don't have to know everything. But th the key here is learn everything you can at every given moment. And, and so you're almost like a child at, er at every turn. So astrology taught me that uh, being human was probably the greatest thing I could be while I'm here because I, I had to learn what not to do as well as what to do. That's perfect. Is there anything else you'd like to close up on or anything else that we need to know about? Um, I, I really look at this this fall, and I'm hoping uh, the 22nd everybody plants that seed. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, harvest that seed and and um, really values what they've done and values what they know and values what they've come to at this point. So we get to this critical time where October, everything starts falling apart or seems to be falling apart, and then early uh, um, November, that then you're ready then to tell the universe that, you can't, you know, there's no chaos enough that's going to stop me. I know that if I just use my faculties, I've got what I need, and I'll get my answer when I need it, and we can fly through this thing. And, and uh, you know, I mm -hmm. want everybody to know they have what they need. It's just up to them to believe in that. You know, so in your own time, what are you doing? You know, are you just laying around watching TV and goofing on your eyes? On your own time, go do something. Make a difference in your world only. The rest of the world don't need to know right now. We'll know that later when we, when we <laughs> encounter you. You know, beautiful, beautiful. Wow, yeah. wow! What a great, what a great two hours, man. You know, no, I mean, it, it's been awesome. And well, we're at the end of the show, so Jim, would would you like to tell our listeners how to get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, you can get me on the YouTube channel, Panther Jim nineteen ninety five. Um, just go to YouTube and type that in, and I'll I'll pop up. Or you can get me on my my website at uh, ypi twenty twelve dot com. That's ypie twenty twelve dot com. Um, I just want to thank you guys again because you guys are so easy to talk to. I feel like I just, you know, we had a couple beers and we were just chatting. So uh, I enjoyed that very much. So, and I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you all have. Oh, thank you. You know, and it always seems to fly by every time that we have you on. And it would be great to bring you back in a few more months if that's okay. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I love talking with you guys. So um, uh, good luck to you. I, I'm following what you're doing, and you're making a difference. And uh, it, it's seen from here, and I'm sure many others. So keep up the great work. And, and the best Thank you can you. be is, is yourself. So do that. You know, I, I appreciate that. Thank you, brother. And thanks again for being our guest on N5D Radio. Yep, I enjoyed it. Take care now. All right. Take care. Bye, Jim. Bye-bye. 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 Yeah, and you can find you can find uh, links to Jim's web- website below the video, as well as to his YouTube channel. So that's going to do it for tonight's show. I would like to thank all of our N5D family for listening, and be sure to check out our other radio shows here on N5D Radio, which includes the Galactic History Show with Andrew Bartsis and Chris Hales every Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern, as well as astrologer Helene Lipson on Wednesday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern. On behalf of my co-host, Kendra, this is Greg from N5D.com. Namaste, everyone.